Distinguished guests, dear media friends, good afternoon. Welcome to CCG Global Experts Dialogue events. I'm Luo Yan, the Communication Director of the CCG. Uh, firstly, please allow me to introduce the distinguished guest, the Vice President of Paris Peace Forum, the former Director General of the WTO, Mr. Pascal Lamy. And, and it is customs, Sun Yongfu, CCG Senior Fellow, the former Ministry of Commerce of the People's Republic of China, Director General of the European Fairs, Ji Wenhua, Professor at School of Law, University of International Business and Economics, Li Siqi, Associate Professor at China Institute for WTO Studies, University of International Business and Economics. Thank you all for coming on a snowy day. Uh, next, let's welcome the president of the CCG, Dr. Hui Yao Wang, to give a welcome remarks. Okay, thank you, uh, Luo Yan. And uh, so, Your Excellency, uh, uh, dear friend, uh, uh, just Pascal Ami, and of course, uh, uh, our distinguished uh, uh, friends and uh, CCG fellows and uh, 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 media friends, and of course, uh, our people from embassy, from uh, different uh, uh, think tanks in, in Beijing. It's really a great honor for us to uh, carry this uh, CCG Global Dialogue in the, uh, you know, amongst the snow in Beijing. We have a big snow, but also in, it's in Chinese saying the big snow signifies a good harvest year, and uh, we hope that we'll, we'll bring the good luck for us. Uh, so so Pascal brought us the snow, but, but, but well, I think it was really great. Uh, that we have a purifying uh, uh, environment uh, for Beijing. I mean, CCG in the past uh, number of years, uh, in the last, particularly in the last three and, uh, three and four years uh, since COVID, we have conducted many global dialogues, and uh, Pascal was was uh, you know actually taking the time uh, to to come to CCG dialogue uh, uh, two times online, and then it is I think four years ago we had Pascal physically here in Beijing and. Uh, I'm very glad to see that he's coming back again uh, after <laughs> COVID pandemic. Uh, so this is really a great occasion to welcome again a uh, uh, distinguished uh, guest of, of Pasca. And uh, you know, we just had a very good uh, lunch with Pasca with, uh, with CCG Honorary Chair Minister Chen Deming and uh, uh, Minister Yi Xiaozhun, uh, who former DDJ of WTO and many friends uh, uh, in Beijing. And so, so this is a very good occasion we have uh, brought uh, Pascal to CCG uh, uh, venue to give us uh, his his keynote, and then we have some dialogue, and then we have some discussion uh, with Pascal. So here I would like to, uh, on behalf of CCG, uh, welcome Mr. Uh, Lamy, and of course uh, I would like to formally introduce him uh, as well. I, I know that uh, uh, Pascal also was a great driving force behind uh, a Paris Peace Forum. He was the former president of a Paris Peace Forum, which now become a very well-known, internationally uh, uh, notable, uh, f you know, flag flagship event of globalization, that launched the pres by President uh, Emmanuel Macron, and uh, Pascal was the uh, was the you know driving force and the, and the first president of this uh, Paris Peace Forum. He's now still the vice president of Paris Peace Forum. And he's also uh, a coordinator of the Jax Deleuze think tanks, which have office in Paris, in Berlin, in Brussels. And of course, he's very famous to be known as the former director general of a WTO World Trade Organization. And of course, he was also the former trade commissioner of the European Commission uh, among his many, many uh, titles. So he's uh, also, uh, at uh, the president of the members of various board uh, with a global uh, European or French uh, vocation, uh, for example, European Selfish Mission, uh, Moral Abraham Foundation, European Climate Foundation, EFRI, uh, PCCC, RE, TMEA, and Truca, uh, 2020, UNDC 2025 provision. Many he's involved in it on the board of those many organizations, and of course he's also at the Trans Transparency International, Alphabet Forum, uh, Beijing Forum, World Trade Forum, WEF Global Risk. Uh, just to just to you know, I lose the count. There's so many. 
so many of that. And then the uh, last time I was, I was, I had met uh, Pascal at the Paris Peace Forum just just in uh, last month. And before that, we were at uh, uh, Salzburg uh, Trilog, which uh, Pascal is a frequent uh, speaker there. Uh, he's also a professor at the China European International Business School, uh, SIPS in Shanghai, and he's going to uh, go to Shanghai tomorrow. And uh, he's also a professor at RCC uh, in Paris. So, so this is really a, a, a very good uh, uh, background of Pascal. And uh, uh, so he actually serves as a two executive ter consecutive terms of the DJ of the, of the World Trade Organization. And of course, with uh, with European Commission uh, as well. So has uh, he has actually also in the front he has become the uh, uh, director of cabinet of the European Commission of the President Jacques, Jacques Deleuze, and his G seven Shaka uh, in in the early nineteen ninety five to uh, nineteen eighty five to nineteen ninety four, and director of the cabinet of the French Prime Minister from ninety three to ninety five. And of course, the French Minister of Economic and Finance in 1981 and 1983. And I was uh, very impressed when Pascal gave us the, the photo that in 1986, he was accompanying uh, uh, Jack Lewis to meet uh, late leader Deng Xiaoping at, at that time when, when China just opened a few years ago. So, so today we are very interested to have him, Pascal, to give us a uh, he, his, uh, his speech and his, his outlook of the what's going on in the world and uh, what has been here, uh, uh, you know, the uh, how, how we can reimagine the international trading system for re-globalization. So, so this is really a very interesting topic as we know that we are facing with all kinds of a, a crisis. I mean, we had a war in, in Ukraine, we had a, we had a conflict in, in the Middle East, in, in uh, uh, in, and we also we have uh, I mean previously we had we had other economic and uh, 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 trade war also you know so so that's really and of course out of this we have the biggest war is the climate we have to fight uh, uh, as 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 mankind so there's many issues we're going to talk about I think Pascal will share his great uh, you know wisdom and his advice to us and I'm sure we'll have a good discussion after that. So I, I appreciate uh, uh, all the all the guests, and I want to also point out we have uh, we have a uh, Bill uh, Kleinman, you know the the uh, the former deputy head of U.S. Embassy. <laughs> He's uh, now also big uh, with a big company now in, in in Berlin. Is also with us today. So so we had many many uh, people coming uh, for this uh, round uh, this afternoon discussion. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Pascal to give his uh, keynote, and let's welcome uh, Pascal to give us keynote. Come in, come in, come in. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, many thanks uh, to my good friend, uh, Henry Wong. And uh, glad to be back uh, in presence uh, to the CCG, uh, with uh, which I've had a long standing working relationship. Uh, Unfortunately, online uh, since uh, December 2019, uh, which is why I'm extremely glad uh, to be back here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, CCG has uh, grown. It's much bigger than it was last time. Uh, so congratulations uh, for that. Uh, you've saddled me with uh, incredibly uh, huge topic for a 15-minute uh, talk, uh, which is uh, reimagining the international trade system uh, in times of uh, re-globalization. But I'll try to remain uh, within my time allotted uh, limit, starting uh, with some uh, nuances I would have on the notion of re-globalization. I know it's uh, an invention of uh, Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, which I like a lot, so I will not disagree a priori uh, with uh, an excellent uh, DG of uh, WTO, uh, but it might imply that we are deglobalizing and that we should have to re-globalize. And this 
if this is the concept, I don't agree with this concept because I don't agree that we are deglobalizing. I agree that globalization is changing and that if re-globalizing means moving to a different kind of globalization, I agree. But not if re-globalization means moving back from globalization and then because of that, uh, back to globalization. We are living a time of change in globalization, uh, a big inflection uh, that we are witnessing. Uh, the old globalization was uh, powered uh, by three major engines, technology, ideology, and peace. And these three engines were pulling globalization together. They were all aligned to pull the period we have known roughly from the 1970s or 80s uh, to roughly 2010. We now are in a quite different period in which the three engines do not work the way they were previously. Technology keeps pushing globalization. This world is uh, interconnected and uh, more and more every day. So there is a huge potential of further globalization, notably in services uh, with uh, digitalization. Ideology uh, is not today where it was 20 years ago. Today, there was a, 20 years ago, uh, there was a sort of ideological consensus that opening trade was the way to go because of the merits of international division of labor, specialization, multi-localization of production systems, spanning uh, the planet with uh, uh, global supply chains. The consensus at the time was that that was the way to go and that obstacle to trade, either existing or to come, were to be addressed and reduced. This has changed. In today's ideology, the, today's ideolog ideological picture of the relationship to trade is much more mixed. Now, you hear people saying uh, trade uh, should be reduced for reasons of uh, national security. And you hear people saying trade uh, should be reduced for reasons of uh, social security. And you hear people saying uh, trade uh, should be reduced for reasons of uh, environmental security. So the ideological landscape has shifted. And as far as peace is concerned, uh, I think uh, we don't need a long demonstration uh, to show that this world is not in peace. Now, not only is it not in peace, it never was really in full peace, but there was no real big fight, battle, war, as the one uh, Russia started by invading uh, Ukraine, or as the one uh, which uh, Hamas uh, started uh, in attacking Israel. Although so far, this has not resulted in a full-blown war in the Middle East. We know that the ingredients of that may be there. So we now are in a world where wars are multiplying and expanding, and this is within a context uh, which has uh, gone worse for the last 20 years, every time, hopefully for the moment, uh, stabilized, which is the US-China rivalry. And this, of course, has a lot of bearing on both the geoeconomics and the geopolitics of this planet. So we are in a different phase of globalization. Trade keeps growing. We've had record volumes of trade in 2022 by the statistics. True, there are some elements of fragmentation. And you can see that in investment flows way before the war in uh, Ukraine. Uh, 
the U.S. investment of China had dropped, huh? when roughly from uh, 20 uh, billion a year uh, in the, uh, the years uh, 2010 uh, to uh, 8 billion in 2020. So in 10 years, it moved down. Same, by the way, uh, for EU investment in China, and same, by the way, for Chinese investment in the U.S. or in EU. So if investment is a precursor of trade, there were signals that already before this major uh, tectonic geopolitical development that the war in Ukraine uh, triggered, some elements were there. But these elements coexist with an increase of trade. So we have both the volumes of trade growing, which is an element of globalization, and some elements of uh, fragmentation. What this will mean uh, for the future, uh, in my view, uh, is uh, unclear. Although overall, if I look at these three engines, technology, ideology, and peace or uh, geopolitical uh, tensions or conflicts, I still believe that overall, these engines will keep pushing for globalization. Now, what does this mean? Uh, for the uh, international uh, trading system. Uh, a, agreements are becoming much more difficult uh, because of this uh, polarization, not just uh, east-west uh, between uh, US and China, but also north-south. Uh, if you look at the votes at the General Assembly of the UN about Ukraine or about uh, Palestine and Israel, you can see that this world is now emotionally divided uh, in two camps. In the case of Ukraine, those who buy the narrative of Putin uh, that uh, NATO uh, was uh, strangling uh, Russia and that Russia had to intervene in order to be not strangled uh, in the future, which in my view is total nuts, but some people believe this and I have to recognize this these people believe this, and it's exactly the same uh, with Hamas and Israel. A lot of people on this planet uh, believe Israel is a colonizer. This is not my view, but I have to recognize that emotionally, a lot of people see things very differently than we Europeans. So this ambience is not conducive to proper international cooperative arrangements. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. The legacy of colonization, the vision uh, by many emerging countries uh, that uh, the international system is not fit for purpose, according to today's relative power distribution, uh, the way uh, we handled uh, COVID, uh, which in my way, and I coined this phrase, uh, was a sort of a vaccine apartheid, uh, which I deeply uh, regret, and many other issues are creating a sort of magnif a sort of frustration which Ukraine or Palestine uh, are uh, inflating. This being said, we need the international traded system to address a few issues. Most of them it has not uh, properly addressed uh, in recent times, and uh, some of them being new. Yeah? And I will mention uh, four of these issues, which in uh, my view are the correct answer uh, to uh, Henry Wong's uh, question. Uh, the first one is trade and environment. The second one is trade and digital. The third one is uh, economic security. And the fourth one is subsidization. Now, on trade and climate, I have to remain short. I spent a week uh, in uh, Dubai last week uh, talking about this and uh, other topics. We have a big problem in that the world trading system and the world climate systems are totally different. On trade, we have norms and no target. And on climate, we have a target and no norms. In the WTO, nobody says trade should be open 60% or 80% or even 
No, we just have rules of behavior that slowly reduce obstacle to trade in a fairly negotiated way. And the fact that it is fairly negotiated is, is, uh, is proven by the fact that countries agree to. On the climate side, it's exactly the other way around. We have a target, which is zero carbon, which is great. I'm all in favor of that because and I chaired the Climate Overshoot Commission during two years, uh, and I now know what global warming really means and what we should do in order to address it. But the way we do it is left to nationally determined contribution. So WTO works with multilater multilaterally determined contribution, and climate works with nationally determined contribution. And as a result, you have a mess in trade. We Europeans price carbon, big way. Uh, but the moment you price carbon seriously, trading with countries where the price of carbon is extremely low is a big problem. No? Because if you do that, you just incentivize carbon leakage. No? Producers within your constituency will move outside and emit carbon elsewhere. So the more you fight carbon in your constituency, you more you trigger uh, more leakage and more carbon emissions elsewhere. So it makes no sense, which is why EU now needs the CBAM. Well, the US uh, don't like pricing carbon, so they do it uh, subsidization. So they, they can print a dollar as much as they want. And in doing this, we Europeans create a trade obstacle at our border with a carbon border adjustment mechanism, and the US create a trade obstacle in totally delivering the, delivering the playing field with their massive subsidization system to uh, greening uh, their economy. And this has trade consequences which need to be addressed. So we need the WTO to intervene. We need WTO members to sit around the table and discuss I'm doing it this way. You are doing it that way. Let me understand why you do it this way. I will explain why I do it this way. And at some stage, we will have to find something which is reasonably compatible. And to, in order to, for it to be compatible, it has to be comparable. And just the way of making these trade relate, climate related trade, me uh, trade measures compatible is a big thing, which I think needs to be done urgently, otherwise it will slow decarbonation. Huh? These trade friction, if we don't address them, will slow something which we are already way too slow to address. Digital uh, trade uh, is uh, in a bit of a better shape. There has been a negotiation for now quite a number of years. There is a digital trade facilitation package on the table. And my view is that the next ministerial conference should pocket what's on the table and stop discussing, maybe we could do this, plus this, plus this. There is a good base on the table <laughs> in present circumstances. If you have a good base on the table, pocket it and then move from there. And this, in my view, is something which is relatively doable now. Economic security is, of course, in this context, which I briefly described, also a big problem. Huh? Mr. Trump pretends that uh, exports of steel from Europe to US are a threat to US security. Not, total not, but for a variety of reasons, the EU decided, and I disagree with that, that this case should be, not be brought to the WTO. Whether EU or US uh, export restrictions to China in the ground of national security are or not justified is an open question. We know that there is a security exception in the Charter of WTO. We know that this has already been litigated. So the WTO can adjudicate a dispute about economic security. 
but I believe that given where the dispute settlement of WTO is given that the US are on strike, something should be done by the members of WTO to give some sort of guiding interpretation of what economic security do, can do. I totally agree that sovereigns need a margin of maneuver, which is their sovereignty and does not have to be appreciated by whatever judge in WTO on grounds of national security. But this, on the other side, cannot be a blanket exception. You cannot do anything just by waving your flag national security. This would destroy uh, the multilateral trading system. So we have an issue there, which I think necessitates uh, a better attention. And finally, subsidization, which is not a new issue. China uh, know that uh, full well. Uh, the problem being that uh, with IRA, uh, the US have turned Chinese. Uh, they now subsidize their industry as much as China used to do it. Uh, after having, by the way, complained in the past that uh, China was too heavily subsidizing its industry, which is absolutely true. Hence, the level of overcapacities which we now have in the Chinese economic system. So that would be my sort of four uh, priorities. Trade priorities, of course, related to other issues. And finally, uh, for my few last uh, minutes, uh, what, uh, what could EU and China do to move this forward? Uh, I think the overall answer is not much, given the state of relationship uh, between uh, EU and China, uh, which has uh, seriously uh, deteriorated. Uh, the main reason why it has deteriorated is uh, the war in Ukraine. We Europeans do not understand why China sides with Russia. China did not recognize uh, the annexation of Crimea uh, by uh, Russia uh, in uh, 2014. So China probably does not like a country invading or seizing the territory of another country. So why is China siding uh, with Mr. Putin? The interpretation can only be that Mr. Putin is against the US and Europe, so China is moving with Mr. Putin because it is against the US and Europe, which then in Europe creates a perception that China does not like us and is against US and Europe. And by the way, putting US and Europe in the same bag, which in my view uh, is a, a large over-interpretation of the situation. So the politics for the moment are bad and it's very difficult to have proper economic uh, discussions in such a uh, political uh, context. And the economics are not good either. Uh, the growth in Europe is low, too low for Europe medium term to entertain its uh, social market system. And the Chinese economy is not, in my view, uh, in good shape. And the structural characteristics of the Chinese economy, which is the over presence of the state-owned system, that leads to a number of production capacities uh, not abiding to market rules. Hence, these over capacities with the sub-consumption uh, in China, I mean, if you compare China to other developing uh, countries of the same sort of, uh, range, the saving rate of the Chinese people is way too low, which is why their consumption is way, way too high, which is why their consumption is way too high. And this structural problem is at the origin of our trade problem. A 400 billion trade deficit is not a trade problem. It's a macroeconomic problem that needs to be addressed macroeconomically. It's not in twisting 
I mean, of course, trade negotiators can do their job. They will do their job. If they do properly their job on this 400 million billion deficit, maybe, maybe they will address, I mean, at the best, 100 billion. Yeah? China would open more. It's a services market. Uh, and uh, EU uh, would uh, rebalance a part of the problems she has in a number of respects. But this will not shrink the 400 billion. The 400 billion are there for other reasons, as by the way, the US massive and permanent trade deficit is there for macroeconomic reasons, which is that the US uh, uh, consume too much and save uh, not enough. So this is a difficult situation, which I think we need to recognize. And on this side, the EU is not yet seen by China as a proper geopolitical interlocutor. China still is unsure uh, whether in the future EU will remain a proper economic integration process or whether at some stage uh, the dreams of Europeans that they will become a sort of full-fledged both geoeconomic and geopolitical power uh, will be fulfilled or not. So China is very careful about this, uh, carefully plays some of its cards with the member states, some of its cards uh, with the EU institutions. And as long as we Europeans remain in this situation, I can understand why China will be cautious yeah? and why some in China still will believe that EU uh, is an American poodle and that in these conditions, uh, we'd better be careful with what we do. We, we have a, a problem also on our side, which we need to address. This being said, and that's my final point, this being said, there is ample room for EU and China looking, for instance, at the four topics I suggested, environment, digitalization, economic security, and subsidization, and in moving more together in moving these issues uh, into uh, the trading system. So there is room for that. The context is not propitious, but uh, state men and state women uh, are there to address including negotiation or discussion in a context which is not favorable. And this is uh, what would be my recommendation is that on both sides, these issues are taken, recognizing that the environment for the moment is not right, but sometimes it's the deal you make when the environment is not right that contributes to change the environment. And that's what I wish. Many thanks for your attention. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Pascal, for your uh, excellent uh, uh, speech. And uh, so you have really uh, highlighted the many uh, uh, key uh, issues and challenges and, of course, opportunities uh, that we have to you know, work together. Uh, of course, we know that uh, economic globalization has really uh, faced the strong headwinds uh, uh, in recent years, marked by challenge of ranging from rapid technology change, which you mentioned about increasing extreme climate events. We see the COP28 just, just happening. And, and of course, also the supply chain issue. There's, uh, there's also of uh, uh, widening inequality uh, in uh, uh, different parts of the world. So, so and, and of course, the WTO organization has come and, uh, uh, you know, strained in, in many aspects. So, so you you've been you, you are you know you are a global visionary you are a global uh, global governance uh, uh, reform uh, also uh, uh, champion and I know you have you have led many groups of that. Uh, so you said you just come back from uh, from uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Dubai on this uh, 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 climate uh, COP twenty eight and you were there. So I, I understand you you are really you championed the uh, climate uh, overshooting commission. Which is a very 
very interesting organi uh, or, or initiative. I've done a lot of uh, research, and uh, and then you have a proposed the care uh, re re reaction, which is cut the emission, adapt uh, the the climate, you know, the lifestyles, and and of course uh, re remove the carbon, and of course explore. So perhaps you know, given you are coming back from from the uh, 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 you know Dubai, and then on the scope twenty eight, and then you this this trade and and climate, and it also cl closely related. So maybe you can elaborate a bit on your, uh, you know, uh, vision of the of the uh, climate uh, 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 climate change uh, challenges and uh, and the views on on give us some update on that. On your you know what's your takeaway on the twenty eight of COP, uh, COP COP twenty eight. Well, I mean, I believe environment, climate change, and biodiversity degradation are our number one problem. When I was uh, 40 years old, I thought uh, social justice was our number one problem. And, I, and I'm not saying it's not the problem, but I think now, collectively, this is a life or death issue for this planet. So it's our number one problem. Biodiversity is a big problem, but science is more divided on biodiversity, notably because biosystems have an inbuilt capacity uh, to morph or regenerate, uh, which physical systems uh, do not have. So climate change is the problem number one, and we need to ramp up our game because we are late. Uh, the, the name of the commission, the Paris Peace Forum created, and I had the privilege to share with a lot of uh, old monkeys and uh, luminaries of my kind. And I selected a commission with a majority of people coming from the South. Uh, it's the first time ever a global body looking at climate issues was composed of a majority of people coming from the South. And I can tell you, it changes a lot of the discussion and vision. We did it because we believe the risks of overshooting 1.5 are now extremely high. By the way, science tells us that we will overshoot 1.5. The open question is whether, for how long will we do it? To, we still have a capacity to decrease this uh, 1.5 uh, augmentation of uh, temperature once we've done it. And this is the open question. So the open question now is not whether we will overshoot or not. It's for how long will we overshoot? And are we able to regain the necessary uh, trajectory? The conclusion of these two years of deliberations is that we have to look at all the options which you mentioned, cut emissions, adaptation, remove carbon, and explore geoengineering, which is a very controversial topic. I will be dealing with that later tonight uh, with uh, Shui Lan, uh, who was a uh, uh, who is a very famous uh, Chinese professor and who was a member of the Climate Overshoot Commission, so including exploring uh, geoengineering in case. And what we recommend is that these options are considered together with the trade-offs it may imply. And this, of course, is a, is a quite a bold uh, proposal. Uh, we propose that the North uh, phases out uh, fossil fuels. And this is, as you know, a uh, discussion uh, in, uh, in Dubai. And I, at the, that time, they might have found a compromise. Uh, we propose things like uh, take back obligations, for instance, which is a big innovation in the way uh, we would uh, handle uh, climate change, uh, so that not just cutting emissions, but also uh, removing uh, carbon, uh, we propose to explore 
geoengineering technology, including solar radiation modification with a moratorium for uh, risky uh, experiments, because some of these experiments may be very risky. The trade side of the report is minimal. I did not want to bother my colleagues with my uh, trade issues, although, although we propose to create within the WTO what I mentioned briefly a moment ago, which is a comparability forum, huh? where countries having different trajectories, different policy instruments, different policies, and different ways to use it, there is some sort of coherence within uh, the way uh, countries address their decarbonation uh, trajectory, which for the moment is not the case. Huh? And I think, and I believe, that WTO should be more affirmative. Now, we all know that the WTO is uh, members of WTO and that the DG uh, does not uh, is not uh, running uh, the shop or partially uh, in some circumstances uh, with some uh, parameters. But I personally believe that developing countries are wrong to resist a discussion on this in WTO, as I believe developed countries are wrong to resist a discussion on this at the COP, at the Paris Agreement COPs. I think this is stupid. The problem is there. And if you refuse to address it for matters of principle in one organization, and the others refuse to address it in another organization, it's typical diplomatic blockage, which makes absolutely no sense. So the first thing to do, and that's the concrete answer to your question, Henry, is let's discuss this issue around the table, both in WTO, which is a trade-related organization, and in COP, which is an environmental-related organization. Great. And that, that's a good uh, good explanation. I think you're absolutely right. I think we all the countries right, <laughs> developed uh, 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 developing, and uh, because I think we need to find a compromise and find a solution uh, to address this issue, which is uh, very urgent uh, in 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 the world uh, uh, agenda. And also, of course, uh, you know, France was the country where the Paris Accord was uh, was reached, uh, you know, um, um, about a, 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 you know almost a decade ago. So that's really important that we we continue that. Uh, I know you have also not only on the climate. You you've been really also championing on on the digital. I mean, we were we were on this digital steering committee of uh, of the digital global governance, and and then you know Europe and U.S. and China all have some different standards, and and now we know that the the digital world is 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 uh, is already a reality, and that's something WTO wasn't really addressed enough in the past. So how do you see this? Uh, Conversion of the of the on the digital digital world, and that's where the uh, the driving force of the global economy and, and China become the sec second large digital uh, economy, and with with one billion smartphone users and and 70 percent of the five G system in the world. So how how do you see the digital world come along and become really not divided and and particularly on standards on governance? And you have done a lot of uh, work on that. Uh, maybe you can share a bit of that as well. No, I believe a digital world will be ideologically fragmented, whereas uh, the uh, analogy, analogical world was much more flat. A bicycle is a bicycle everywhere on this planet. A shirt is a shirt. A shoe is a shoe. Uh, uh, a cow is a cow. There is no ideological big difference. Data are an issue which people see very differently depending on their philosophical or political or moral positions. So you don't have what intellectuals call cognitive dissonances about cars or shoes, but you have cognitive differences between countries and civilizations on data, which is why, for the moment, we have a Chinese 
system, we have a US system, and we have an EU system. And the differences in these systems stem from philosophical differences. And we all have good reasons to stick to the values uh, which we believe in and in which we have been uh, educated and, uh, and shaped. Now, there's one big question mark in this three, uh, in this triangle, uh, which is where will India go? Uh, India is a, potentially a major digital power. Uh, whether India will go Chinese, I doubt it. Uh, whether India will go US, maybe, or EU, maybe, or India. After all, uh, they may all have they have a domestic market that allows economies of scale. Uh, that would make sense. So that's the difference between the previous world. Inevitably, the regulation of the use of data, privacy, storage, accessibility, transborder flows, control. This is different. So there will be only limited convergence. Now, there is convergence. Huh? If you look, for instance, at the mm -hmm. way China regulates platforms to avoid excessive market power, we do it exactly the same way in Europe. Exactly, for the same reasons. So our digital competition attitude is very similar. It's different in the US for the moment, and as you know, it's changing. So it doesn't mean a sort of clustered world. In some areas, we will have, uh, if uh, at least uh, compatible, if not uh, similar attitudes. In other areas, we have to forget convergence and organize coexistence. And in the digital world, coexistence means interoperability, technically. And this is true both for software and for hardware. And this is where the WTO comes in. WTO is one of the levers. We will not level the playing field, but we will avoid the level playing field for the reasons I rapidly gave to have too many cost consequences. Inevitably, a divided system in a global market capitalist system, whether you like it or not, is more costly uh, than, uh, than a level uh, system because of simple reasoning on economies of scale. So now the WTO is not the only international organization that can try to make the system interoperable. The ITU has a role to play. I think, by the way, organizations like the Paris Peace Forum, where you have not only uh, sovereigns, but also big multinational companies, NGOs, major academic institutions, think tanks, can also help moving this in a compatibility direction. But this is where the, w the WTO should intervene, where there are the necessary space for facilitation and compatibility and interoperability. This should be uh, the focus. I don't think the WTO should tell EU or China or US how they should regulate. This is uh, an issue uh, for uh, them to decide, but adjusting the interstices is where the WTO should step in. That's a very good uh, uh, inside view. I mean, <laughs> Of course, the Paris Peace Forum has done already quite a lot in terms of bringing all the players together. And then you have also proposed many good suggestions. So absolutely, I think you, how to coexist the, the different system where, where uh, WTO can also play a very important role. Uh, just, just changing a little bit on that. I, I noticed that the EU has recently had some new uh, 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 you know, courses and a new standard on, on AI. You know, there's a new <laughs> agreement on that. Uh, so what do you think about AI now? I mean, I mean, also it's become a bit of a summit between President Xi and President Biden uh, in, in San Francisco, where Graham Allison sent me a, 
article that of his he, he was co-author with Henry Kissinger, the, the last piece of Dr. Kissinger on this AI threat, a uh, possible side effect that uh, that the human beings may, may may have, may not be able to control. And, and what do you think about that and how China, US, EU can work together on this uh, uh, AI uh, uh, future, uh, whether we can harness it or whether we're going to be controlled by it. <laughs> What's the what's the way to get get into that? Well, I'm uh, an optimistic, which uh, does not make my life uh, easy in present uh, times. I believe AI has huge offers, huge opportunities in areas like uh, science, uh, medicine, for instance. I also believe AI entails risks. Notably, because the more uh, these uh, algorithms uh, became uh, sophisticated, and they become more and more sophisticated as they learn, and I'm talking about the part of AI, which is about uh, machine learning, there is a risk. And these risks need to be regulated by the sovereign. I'm not saying they should be regulated forever. <laughs> Things are changing incredibly rapidly. And I know of people who say it's absolutely stupid to regulate today a world that's going to be totally different five years from now. I don't buy this argument. I think we can progress by trial and errors. And I think that the public need to believe that AI is something which is governed, honest, in a way that it will not turn again humans or, uh, 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 or normal political public goods. So we need to regulate it, and we do it in different ways. Now, we all do it. China does it, US did it with the executive order recently, which is a good quality. The Chinese system is quite sophisticated and very advanced, and the EU just agreed on the legislative package last week in Brussels, uh, which is, in a way, more precautionary than US or China. But this is a our culture, uh, for many, many reasons, uh, the Europeans have, I mean, a culture which is uh, more inclined to precaution and less to risk. There are good sides of that, there are bad sides of that, by the way. So the question, I mean, we're back to what do we do with different regulation? The good thing is that we all in common believe that there are risks. And the nature of the risk, which uh, the Chinese regulation or the EU regulation or the US regulation is meant to address is quite similar. What differs is the spectrum of what is very risky and what is not risky. We all recognize that we need to regulate because of risk, but we don't have, and, and that's natural. Huh? Risk is a scale between good and bad. Whether something is more risky or not is whether it's worse or better. And good and bad is something which is fundamentally moral or philosophical. Huh? It's not a machine that will tell you whether it's good and bad. So that's the issue. And then we have to try and make sure that Again, regulating AI does not fragment too much our uh, digital world. For the moment, there are elements of fragmentation. Uh, you have a G7 uh, working group, and China has launched its own forum to discuss that, and UK just invented one. Uh, the G20 will probably uh, do it at some stage. So. And it's, in a way, a bit inevitable. But long term, again, we need more convergence on this. And by the way, I had a 
long discussion with the UNSG uh, in September when I gave him the Climate Overshoot uh, Commission uh, report. Uh, and I mean, he is of the view that the UN should create enough muscle expertise to have a body that is overseeing the way AI is regulated. Uh, and uh, I agree with that. Uh, it's something which, again, which we will have in common. We have our differences in the way we handle this, but we need an overall arching system that limits divergences and that at least organizes coexistences. And by the way, the uh, Center for European Regulation, which produced the first report about global digital ecosystems at the Paris Peace Forum in 2022, is now working on a new version, this time with uh, separate briefs, uh, the first of which uh, appeared uh, 10 days ago in, uh, in Brussels before the legislation was uh, adopted. Great, you have a, uh, gave us a lot of a good uh, food for thought. I think EU has already started legislative work on that and, and also we'll see how we can really get those uh, different major economy working together and some convergency with, with, with possibly WTO. So, so before I open for for our discussion, and and of course uh, uh, our, uh, our medias and and friends, and I, my final question is that I cannot uh, let you go without asking a question about WTO. You you are one of the key uh, architect of 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 uh, global governance in in many uh, uh, ways, you know, like climate and uh, and digital and uh, and AI. But but what about the WTO? We are having the thirteenth minister meeting comes up. Uh, in Dubai uh, next next uh, next year, early next year, and uh, WTO seems to be the driving force, of, uh, one of the key, you know, very important driving force of globalization. And China probably is the the largest beneficiary of WTO, and uh, and of course uh, uh, many other countries do. So so now WTO has has many challenges. It will have an appellate body has been you know basically uh, paralyzed to some extent, and then it's difficult to reach. Uh, new consensus, even though we did some fishery and other uh, trade liberalization uh, uh, things. But what do you see the WTO had, and how can we, China, EU, and US, and and secretary, uh, uh, you know, body of the WTO, you know, what more can 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 be done, and how can we really enhance the WTO, which I think in the end people have to come back to the reality. We have so many different divisions, so many new things coming up. We don't, yeah, don't have a strong organization like WTO, which in the past 70 some years has uh, has greatly uh, changed the world. And so we have, still have to work together. And and you have been eight years as a, a DJ of the WTO. What's your vision and reform uh, or re advice for WTO and how we can, China, US, you can work together as the three largest economy in the world? Okay, we, yeah. we have what, two, two and a half hours for that? No, no. <laughs> okay. You can give a five, five minute talk. <laughs> so, I mean, rapidly, sure. we have three problems. The first one is credibility because of the way the dispute settlement system has been paralyzed by the US. Now, this stems from a wrong interpretation, in my view, of the WTO statute. It was interpreted in a way that the nomination of judges to the appellate body is needs to be done by consensus. This is not what the Charter of WTO says. But for a variety of reasons, uh, it was accepted that they should interpret it this way and nobody else uh, made enough of the case that that was not the right interpretation of the WTO statute. This is a procedural matter. Uh, nominating seven judges in a body is not something for a consensus or unanimity. But leave that aside. So we have a problem in that for the moment, the enforcement mechanism, which is the distinctive feature of the WTO, is paralyzed. So this needs to be fixed. And it's going to be fixed in two possible scenarios. Either the US 
re-accept what they have accepted in signing the WTO agreement in 1994, that the dispute settlement is binding on the members. A losing party has to comply, otherwise there will be measures. This is what the US signed in 1994. Do they still stand to this commitment? Yes or no? If yes, you lock 10 WTO negotiators in a room uh, during uh, two days and you tell them they will only go out uh, when they have an agreement and they will have an agreement. Uh, it's perfectly doable. Uh, the, the, the issues at stake are perfectly negotiable. If the US do not accept to go back to their commitment, then we are in a totally different world. Uh, we will need a, dis a binding dispute settlement with all the members but the US. And this will mean de facto that the US are stepping out of WTO. Right? This is problem number one. Problem number two is the way the WTO works and the balance between the authority of the Secretariat and the DG and the authority of the members. This notion that the WTO is a member-driven organization does not make sense. Of course, it's driven by its members, like any international organization is created and agreed and framed by the members. But that any sort of decision, which is a serious one, has to go to the consensus of the members, that the DG or the Secretariat have zero authority to table a proposal to fix a trade problem that exists, that has been identified. These people are incredibly good experts. They know the countries, they know their position, they know the problems. So exiting them from the negotiating system is an absurdity. You lose an enormous capacity to do things properly, quickly, scientifically, expertly, politically. Uh, it's stupid. And this rebalancing is not on the cards. Uh, and the reason why it's not in the cards is that the members want to stick the notion that they decide everything. Uh, I've often quoted an anecdote, which is that when I became DG of WTO, I was given by a former DDG who was an Australian uh, very witty guy and very good caricaturist. I was given a cartoon with a tree, a very nice tree, well drawn with nice uh, uh, big trunk and nice leaves. And a car had crashed into the street. And the car is all over the place, totally broken. And the legion of the cartoon is member driven car. And I had I had this cartoon in my office <laughs> in the WTO. So this is a bad system. It needs to be fixed and rebalanced if you want WTO to work like a normal organization where there is a division between political authority, technical proposals. But this really needs to be fixed. And then third, we need uh, the WTO to address the few issues which I mentioned, like uh, trade and environment, like digitalization, like economic security, like subsidization, which has been there for a long time, uh, uh, but is now a, a bigger problem than before, because before only China, China was heavily subsidizing. Now the US are subsidizing as much as China. So it becomes an enormous problem for many poorer developing countries. Uh, in a subsidy war, they will be the losers. Uh, so these issues need to be addressed. And if you tick these uh, three boxes, you will go back to the normal situation where global market capitalism needs a properly regulated multilateral trade system uh, with obstacles to trade that appear being addressed and reduced in a negotiated uh, fair way. 
great. You have uh, mentioned all those uh, key points, I think, that we have to uh, address uh, uh, collectively. Uh, now, I would like to open to our uh, discussion. I mean, we have uh, uh, quite a few experts here, and uh, uh, so so we'd like to hear from them. Uh, perhaps, uh, 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 D D DJ Sun, you can start first, and you are the a former Director General of European uh, Department, but I know in the early days also you worked in the International <laughs> Organization Liaison Department, so so maybe your comment, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lamy, and uh, we know each other for many years because I was 12 years as a DG for European, European Department in, in MOFCOM and uh, with our leaders and with our ministers. We had uh, very serious discussions concerning China-EU trade-related matters. And uh, I have two questions to you. One is that, uh, uh, you know, from January to uh, October of this year, the China-EU trade decreased by 7.5%. This haven't been seen for many years, at least, I think, 30 years. In my term as a, a DG for European Department, and we have very good economic and trade relations. And EU is our number one trading partner for 16 uh, consecutive years. So we haven't seen this decreasing of our bilateral trade. What your idea uh, of this uh, phenomenon is uh, a kind of a short term you know, situation because of the shrinking of the demand from both sides and shrinking of the, uh, you know, uh, of the uh, not so rosy economic situations in, in EU and, and also in China, or because of the three definitions of, uh, you know, EU put China as a, you know, partner, competitor, and systematic uh, rivalry. If that make some sense because of that, you know, rivalry that, you know, EU-China economic relations uh, decreased. Uh, this one, you know, question. The other is concerning the investment. Uh, we have the so-called, uh, you know, comprehensive agreement on investment. That's, uh, you know, the, 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 conclusion was uh, finalized in uh, 2020 and our leader from Xi Jinping and the leaders from the EU announced that uh, we you know uh, uh, we have uh, concluded our discussion concerning the CAI but because of the Xinjiang you know so called uh, human rights issues because of the you know uh, the 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 uh, geopolitical issues and this AI is is dead in some way. Do you see any possibilities to revitalize this CAI, you know, uh, to be putting forward in a realistic way? Or in the short term, you don't believe that CAI will be, uh, you know, in the right track uh, in, in in five or ten years, even. So that's my two questions to you. Thank you very much. So on on the first question, I mean, I think uh, this uh, decrease in uh, bilateral trade stems from uh, three factors. Uh, one is a weaker investment in the previous years the EU investment in China has decreased consistently for the last four or five years. Uh, in, in a nutshell, big companies remain in China and keep investing, notably uh, German companies, uh, but the inflow of mid-size companies' investment has dropped. And the reason behind that is the, the perception uh, in uh, European public opinion uh, that uh, China is less secure than it used to be. And of course, politics play a big role in it. So 
I think there is an inevitable trade consequence of slowing down of uh, investment flows. The second is that there still are serious obstacles to trade and investment in China. Uh -huh. I created, when I was European Trade Commissioner, the uh, EU Chamber in Commerce in China. If you read the report of the EU Chamber, and I know right. the Chinese administration does that because they work seriously, there are still too many obstacles <laughs> to, uh, uh, to trade and, uh, and investment from the EU into China, including, by the way, areas where the investment regime for EU is less favorable than for the US. Which is a uh, which is a bit of a, an oddity, at least in my view. And then uh, there is the weak economy on both sides, uh, which of course uh, matters. Uh, so that would be, I mean, how much for each of these? I probably do not know, and I should uh, look seriously at the numbers to say it's uh, thirty percent and forty percent and thirty percent. But that's my that's my sense. Now on the on the CHI, on the uh, investment uh, agreement, I will be very candid. Huh? China overreacted to a resolution by uh, voted by some members of the European Parliament, as sometimes China does. Huh? China overreacted uh, with Australia. Uh, uh, when Australia asked for a, a body investigating the origins of COVID. I mean, China overreacted when uh, Lithuania uh, did uh, something that could have uh, made the vision that the one country, two system might have been questioned if, 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 if. So, but this, this is, and I, I will not say more because we all know that within the Chinese system, in this sort of cases, some say, take it easy, and others say, no, boom, you know, there's a proverb huh? in Chinese, which is about uh, frightening chicken uh, to make sure the monkey understands. Huh? But that's how it works. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. And also, uh, Mr. Sun, uh, CCG Senior Fellow. But I like to also like the uh, Professor Ji Wenhua. He's the uh, at the School of Law, University of International Business and Economics. You, you are here also. <laughs> What, what's your uh, comment and question? Okay, thank you very much. And first, I thank uh, uh, President Wang for inviting me here. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, uh, your Excellency, uh, Mr. Pascalambi, for your very enlightening and informative presentation and your answers to, to the questions. Uh, indeed, before uh, President Wang addressed uh, the first, the last question to you, I think uh, I would raise a question about the dispute settlement because you missed this issue in your previous presentations and and uh, it seemed for me that uh, I remember took the reform, took the uh, the reform of the dispute settlement system as a priority of the W reform. Uh, since you, you you raised this question, I will go a bit further because and uh, I, uh, I I I meet you when I worked in the China mission to the WTO. You are frequently requested by us to nominate the, the chair of the panel. <laughs> so I think uh, I will continue uh, my dialogue with you on this issue. Now, uh, we all know the problem that the U.S. blocked the nomination of the appellate body. So and uh, the appellate body was uh, paralyzed. There's no no, no uh, incumbent member. Uh, you mentioned the two possible solutions. One is that the U.S. rejoin the consensus, which means, OK, accept the, 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 the binding the EU. Another one is that, OK, the U.S. was hostage. And uh, 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 I think, well, of course, and the, the last situation is not the optimal one. Uh, it will cause a huge damage to the multilateral system, not only to the dispute settlement system. So I personally uh, uh, made the proposal, compromise proposal, to, because and at least the, the, at this stage, from the proposal tabled by the U.S. in the negotiations, the U.S. has no intent to leave this system. It's just uh, want to, to not hope the uh, re-establishment of the body. So at least uh, the U.S. Uh, wish to accept the binding nature, because whether this is their real intention uh, is to be seen in the in, during the MC13. My question is that well, the, the 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 intention of the U.S. is important, 
So what's the real intention or what's the role the, US, the EU would like to play? Because China's position is very clear. And um, in bilateral uh, 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 forum and the multilateral forum, China voice this uh, concern that we wish to have a two-tier binding system. The EU is also a proponent of the binding system and a, a supporter in even uh, 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 the, 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 the the main pro 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 proponent of the MPIA. However, and the, the recent G7 trade minister declaration or uh, 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 submit declarations, and the G7 members only repeat what the language in MC MC12. There's no further any explanation. So uh, from my perspective, I didn't see EU as a main player with two exercise further pressure on US to make a further compromise or make its intention clear. So, so I, 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 I have a little bit of concern with the, the possible change of the, EU, the EU's position on this issue. Uh, to put my question more clearly, uh, if we cannot make any progress on, at the MC13 on dispute settlements, uh, the issue, Will the U.S. Will the EU leave the question as it is, or will coordinate with China and other members to put more pressure on the U.S.? Thank you. I mean, I think we have to go back to the essential. Uh, the essential is whether the U.S. or not accept the binding nature of the DSM, and this is unclear. This is unclear. And this is the defining line between a acceptable solution or a non-acceptable solution for the others, including the EU. And we have, I mean, I was chief of staff of the president of the EU commission when uh, the uh, EU round concluded with the Marrakesh agreement. And the binding nature of the dispute settlement was a last minute, very last minute addition, which was negotiated between my predecessor, uh, Leon Britton, and Mike Cantor, uh, who was then uh, USCR, on an instruction of Mr. Delors, who said, we need a binding dispute settlement. Leon Britain was, I mean, did what he was told to do, but he's a, he's a British. So the notion that we would export uh, to the WTO a sort of a supranational authority was not very familiar to him, but he accepted it. And he convinced Mike Cantor, who was a very shrewd guy, to accept it. And then Mike Cantor went to the US Congress at the moment of ratification and said, well, don't you worry. Uh, uh, no, look at the wording. Uh, it says that uh, it says that uh, determinations must be adopted by the members. And he didn't insist on the fact that there's a footnote, which was added, which makes the whole difference, which says the losing party cannot oppose the consensus. And of course, if the losing party cannot oppose the consensus, the decision is taken against the losing party, and then it has to comply. So Mickey Cantor was very clever in him. But the fundamental issue behind all this uh, is whether the United States of America accept or not what they have never accepted before, which is the binding authority of a supranational body. Now, I would never put things in this way in Washington, <laughs> because they would be terrified at what they did. Uh, but I mean, this is this is the real issue. Uh, 
Now, the reason why Mickey Cantor convinced Congress, he said, we need a system that may, will make the others abide. And this will be good for the US, which by the way is absolutely true. <laughs> it's absolutely true that it's good for the US that the others abide. But of course it's good for the others that the US abide. So this is, I mean, this is the key question. Uh, and it's, and it's, a, it's a major political problem uh, for uh, the US. And if I was, if I was uh, trying to convince Congress, I would say, if the system does not oblige China to comply, then it's a bad system. And they would say, oh, yes, that's absolutely true. So this is the issue. If this is solved, I think uh, the rest will follow. I think the EU, for the moment, is holding a sort of a tactical position. And if the US make it clear that it remains binding, they will flexibilize their, they will flexibilize their position. And by the way, I also believe that if China was publicly more outspoken on the fact that the system has to remain binding, this would be good for the negotiation and good for China. That, that's good advice. I think if both EU and China can you know, stick together and have a strong voice uh, of this support this system, that will certainly <laughs> helps. Uh, now I'd like to have, invite another expert, uh, uh, Professor Li Siqi, he's at uh, China Institute for WT Studies at the University of uh, International Business and Economy. And what's your comment and question, please? Thanks for having me in this round table discussion. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is regarding the power transformation in the WTO. We all know that there is a leadership deficit in the WTO due to the shifting position of the US, but actually the, this power transformation has already taken place since China's accession to the WTO uh, upon the Doha round. So what's your perspective on China's current role in the WTO reform agenda? Is that possible for China and other emerging economies or also some developed countries uh, uh, to form a collective leadership role in this WTO reform agenda? Um, my second question is, is regarding the prospect of the WTO. We all know that we, we are facing a consensus-based uh, deadlock in multilateral negotiations. So some countries, they have um, a feasible alternative to turn to the JSI ne negotiations, but the, uh, it is um, against uh, by certain developed, developing members like India, Africa, to question this dual track negotiation approach in the WTO. So what is your perspective on this JSI approach is that could be uh, the mainstream negotiation model in the WTO. So thank you. Uh, on the first one, I think the political reality is that the feeling prevailed until now for the last 20 years in China that the accession ticket was overpaid. This is the feeling on average and I negotiated the, the final, final, final deal with the uh, premier Suongji uh, himself. And I can understand why in the Chinese system, there is a remnant view that uh, accession was paid here. And it is absolutely true that if you compare the level of development to China in, uh, 20, in uh, 2000 to uh, Brazil, or uh, India uh, or uh, other similar countries at the time, their trade regime is less open than the Chinese one. So as a consequence of that, China never was very forthcoming uh, to move to a further round of liberalization. And by the way, the best evidence of that is that each time during the negotiation of the Doha round, we would reach a stage where mm -mm, there might be an agreement. China 
I'm a recently accelerated country. I'm a recently accelerated country, so I, I need a rebate. So that's 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 the reality. Now, given that the area where WTO rules are weak and do not constrain China enough, in my view, but which is also the view of many countries on this planet uh, who are not as rich as China to subsidize their production system, given that China knew that if there was to be a new uh, trade opening uh, package, subsidies would come in the discussion, China made sure that they would not be exposed. So if you add these two elements, this explains a certain passivity. Not that China did not abide by its commitment. It did. And I've always said that publicly. When I was EU Trade Commissioner, when I was DG of WTO, uh, this notion that uh, China cheated uh, the accession uh, and did not properly uh, abide. Uh, this is not. China did abide by its obligations, but in the sector of subsidization, the obligations of China were not strong enough. And the ones who are responsible for that are people like me and uh, the USTR and the Japanese trade negotiator at the time were the big shots that negotiated China's accession. We, at the time, overestimated the value of market access and underestimated the value of binding rules on subsidization. Because we did not, at the time, we, didn't, we, we were appetized by the opening of the Chinese market, and rightly so, and the pressure on my back as a negotiator was not about subsidies. The pressure on my back was on opening this and this and this and this, which was not opened enough by telecoms, for instance. But we did not pay enough attention to uh, subsidies. And we thought that the curse which had been initiated by Deng Xiaoping, which is uh, reform, opening, privatization, would be pursued. And we got it wrong. From 2010 on, China changed course, and the state-owned sector re-augmented its proportion in the economy, and the subsidization, as a consequence of that, re-augmented. So it, we, we did an error in not properly forecasting what China would be 20 years from then. We, we, and by the way, each time, and I wrote this in a piece which was published in a few months ago, when the US trade negotiator and myself discuss the issue of subsidies, both of us were in favor of moving more aggressively on subsidies. But in both of our teams, the lawyers told us, mm -mm, be careful if you start shrinking the stitches of the net of subsidies, our subsidies will be caught. Airbus and Boeing, for instance. And so we wrongly, wrongly listened to our lawyers when they told us, be prudent, be careful, they will, uh, we will be caught. So, so there's, that's, that's the basic explanation of this situation where China abided, but really did not ask for more. Now, on, on your second question, you cannot, given the implications of removing trade obstacles for countries, you cannot impose a decision on US, China, Europe, or India, let's say. Inevitably, you need a consensus where big trade elephants, US, EU, China, India, are in agreement. Now, 
consensus is not unanimity. Yeah. There is a big difference between consensus and unanimity. Consensus is something you build, and at some stage the chair says, I believe there is a consensus. And if somebody objects, the somebody says, oh, no, 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 I disagree. Unanimity is totally different. Uh, unanimity is, are you all in agreement? Please raise your country tag. And this is totally a totally different group dynamic. So consensus is something you can build. And roughly speaking, if you have an agreement between these major elephants, a deal is done. So it's, it's consensus among the major players and leaders. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, Uruguay or Thailand would not agree with me. Say, oh, 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 we will have to agree. But the experience shows that if this group agrees, it's, it's, it's a balance, basically. Uh, US, EU, uh, I could add Japan, because Japan would oh, no, have to be in the and then you look at the composition of the green room. Huh? The composition of the green room, which is a sort of bureau of uh, WTO or executive uh, whatever, that's how it works. So it, I mean, dwelling on consensus or majority is not the right, is not the right issue. Okay, good. Uh, uh, I think we're, we're running out of time and uh... Maybe I, I know we had a, a, a quite a few journalists. Uh, there were one uh, interviewed uh, Pascal before the conference, and we still probably have uh, one quick question for uh, People's Daily uh, uh, correspondent. Just just quickly, yeah. Uh. Wait. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lamy. Uh, one question, very sim very simple. I'm a reporter from People's Daily Overseas website. Uh, you mentioned that Chinese economy is not in good shape. Uh, before. Uh, my question is that despite the challenges, China has achieved success in some areas such as electric vehicles. So in your opinion, which sector is the highlight of China's economy this year and why? Thank you. Sir. Now on, on EVs, <laughs> China has massively invested with public subsidization in production of EVs. And they've reached a formidable level of cost to quality ratio, notably thanks to these public subsidies. Now, the domestic demand in China for EVs is lower than the capacity which has been built. So China is producing very good price to quality EVs, too much for the internal market, way too much for the internal market, and has to export it. Now, where can China export? Where are the big markets? US, Japan, EU, Turkey. Three of them are closed to exports of Chinese good quality price ratio EVs. Only one is open, which is Europe. And this is not sustainable. Europe will not absorb only in Europe the overcapacity of the Chinese production system. This has to be either shrunk or shared. It's as simple as that. And I'm, I'm the first to recognize that China did extremely well. But if others close, you cannot remain open. Although if we do that, we'll have a huge political problem uh, with uh, our constituencies. Huh? They will have to close <laughs> their propulsion factories. They will have to keep building their own EV capacity, which they do, but at a slower rate than China, notably uh, because uh, capi the, the, the necessary capex is not subsidized or, or less subsidized, although it has now to be subsidized, 
uh, but that's that's the situation. Yeah, probably we, we, we have to conclude there, but uh, but I just want to add a comment, Pascal. I think that uh, uh, you know subsidy, of course, uh, is is needs to be discussed. I know that U.S. now is starting to have a lot of re re inflation redu re reduction act and uh, chips act. There's so a lot of a lot of subsidy, but on the other hand, also you know the you talk about U.S. close their EV car market, but Tesla make half of the EV car in China, and then they export to Europe too. <laughs> so. So so uh, so probably we 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 need to see, but you know, and also for all those German and many European automakers in China, they are really also developing EV cars here. Also, here is the uh, state of our technology and R and D center. So probably we need to work on that and uh, to collectively find a way to solve that so that we can meet the target of uh, you know carbon uh, peak and carbon neutral. Uh, otherwise, you know, if we start another trade friction or trade trade war or you know that probably going to slow down uh, the overall objective of, of achieving the carbon uh, neutrality. Uh, uh, you know, with all the all the countries and China, countries trying to do so. So probably we have you're, you're absolutely right, <laughs> Henry. Tesla sells cars everywhere, but it's a totally different market segment from what the Chinese sell. It's it's extremely good quality. And terribly expensive, whereas the Chinese cars are good quality and very cheap. <laughs> okay, we need to increase the price probably. Anyway, no, again, and I think we had a very good discussion. You have, uh, you know, you're, you, you've been traveling around. You, you've you been involved in many rounds of global uh, negotiations. Of course, you're leading still on the climate and digital AI many area front. And also, it's great that we, we have your back. Uh, uh, and uh, to hear your views and uh, to 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 have a good con con candid and constructive discussion. So, I uh, really appreciate your coming and also our, our fellows and our experts and our media friends and also of course with people from from embassy from uh, different uh, uh, think tanks. So, on behalf of CCG, I would like to thank uh, Pascal, uh, you know, our speaker today very much, and but also to all the audience coming here today. Thank you very much. We Hello. will conclude that. But before you go, I'll give you the uh, a, a little souvenir, and uh, so this this is the latest book we did for uh, uh, for Graham Allison and Joseph and I. We hope to do one for you. Okay. <laughs>